Okay, I want to say good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start our Q&A. Thank y'all for being a part of this question and answer. And again, uh, brothers and sisters, y'all have anybody that uh, don't even share in our religious convictions that would like to be a part of these Zoom studies, Q&A, invite them on. And uh, I'm sure we'll all do our part in making sure that we don't you know, embarrass anybody or, or hurt anybody's uh, feelings, but uh, for they can ask any question they might have concerning the Word of God. And we'll just hold each other accountable to make sure whatever questions are asked, we give book, chapter, and verse. We'll keep Brother Handyard in our prayers, as he already mentioned. He's not feeling 100%. Uh, he has a procedure on December the 27th, okay? Uh, go see a, a, a heart doctor, run some tests on him. So we're going to pray for that good brother, uh, that God will heal his body, and that they will be able to find out what's going on uh, with, our, with our brother Handyard, okay? Uh, also, I want to ask you all to pray for my daughters and uh, my Sister-in-law, they're on the road to travel. and They'll be out of town until Monday. Uh, so just keep them, if y'all could, in your thoughts and prayers as, as well, okay? Uh, are there any other prayer requests? I don't want to miss anybody. Any other prayer requests? Sister Hernandez, we are going to pray for you and your family as well. I know you asked for prayers uh, the other day oh. for your family. And we'll definitely keep uh, Sister Hernandez's family in your prayers and the, and the little soul that she was asking prayers for too as well. Anybody else? Yes, sir, Brother Stevenson. Me and my wife just continue to keep us in prayer. Okay, sure will, Brother Green. So we'll keep the Green family in our thoughts and prayers. Anyone else? Anybody else? Okay, if not, uh, Brother Coffee, can you just, you mind in a position to take us up, Brother, and get us started? Okay, thank you, Brother Coffee. Let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day, another opportunity, Father, to call upon your name and to gather together with the saints to look at another portion of your word. We thank you, Father, for keeping us safe throughout this day. We thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus Christ, Father, who died for us and who gave us an opportunity, Father, to hear the gospel and believe. We thank you, Father, for your word, Father, which gives us hope. We thank you, Father, now that we thank you for our teacher tonight, Father, who took time to study your word, um, to teach us, Father, what thus saith the Lord. And we pray, Father, that you will be with him, Father, as we um, study your word, that all the things that you studied will come back to his recollection. We also now have a few requests, Father. We just pray for the uh, Stevenson's daughter and for those that are on the road of travel, Father. We just pray that you would keep them safe um, as they go to and fro on these dangerous highways, Father. We just pray that they will um, enjoy themselves while they are away and, and return home to their family um, that they can reconnect with. We also continue to pray for our brother um, Hanyard, um, who's not feeling his best, Father. We just pray that um, whatever's going on inside your, his body, that you would a lot of the doctors and the nurses that will um, take part in his, um, his evaluation will find what it is that's going on with our brother that while you do all things well, and we believe by faith that you will heal his body. We also continue to pray for Sister Hernandez and her and her family, Father. We just pray for her endeavors to keep them safe. And we just pray that our sister will continue to, to fight a good fight of faith. And so we thank you, Father, for her consistency to call upon your name on behalf of her family. We also pray for Brother Green and his wife, Father. We just pray that you will continue to be with them, strengthen them in all the areas of their lives, Father. We just pray that um, that we will continue to hear the good reports of the things that are going on in their, in their home. And we just thank you, Father, for all the families that are on here tonight. We just pray for all of the husbands and wives and children and loved ones that's connected. And we just pray that you will keep us all safe. And for those that obey the gospel, we will continue to share the gospel with those that um, have not obeyed, that they may have their souls saved according to the scriptures. So forgive us, the Lord, of our sins and cleanse us, Father, from all unrighteousness. And we thank you and ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Coffee, wonderful prayer, my brother. And thank, thank you so much, Brother Preacher. I am really appreciate your prayer. Tonight, I just want to look at a few questions from God, okay? We're going to look at some questions that God asks. This is our Q&A. And then... We'll open it up for any questions anybody here might have. Let's go to Genesis chapter three. And what I want to do is I want to look at the first 13 verses in chapter three, because chapter three is where we see the fall of man. Adam and Eve's fall uh, is recorded for us here in Genesis chapter three. And I just want to pay attention to some things, uh, some things that are said in Genesis in Genesis chapter three. Uh, and then look at some questions that are asked as well. Now, verse number one. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, that God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, I want to stop there and just show you the first question in the Bible is a question asked by Satan. And what Satan is doing as he's talking to Eve, he is questioning the authority of God. So the first question in the Bible is a question that's questioning something that God said, okay? And it's a question that's asked by Satan. 
And the woman said, verse 2, under the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasing, a pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave it also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is it that thou has done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. All right. And so here we have uh, the fall of man. Adam and Eve has done something uh, because of her deception uh, by Satan and Adam listening to his wife. Uh, they have now fallen into uh, sin. Uh, uh, sin has now actually entered into the world. And so what we're going to notice in these in this text is that God, after they sin, God had a series of questions uh, to ask Adam and Eve. Now, I think we understand when God asks a question, brothers and sisters, he's not asking to get information. When God asks a question, he's looking for he's looking for you and I to repent or he's He's looking to ask questions to get us to look at where our relationship is with him. OK, because uh, God does not uh, need you and I to tell him something that he, he doesn't already know. See, a lot of times I want to say this. A lot of times, brothers and sisters, we like uh, as human beings, we, we question God. You know, you find that oftentimes in, in human beings life, you may question, do God really love me? Do you really love me? Or God, how could you allow this to happen in my life? Where were you? Even as we studied uh, this past week, we looked at John uh, chapter 11, Martha and, and, and Mary, you know, where they had the idea, Lord, if you were here, where were you? If you were here, my brother would not have died. But we need to understand that God questions man. That's what he does. And you often see that in the scripture. And again, not because he doesn't know the answer, but it's for our benefit. OK, so when God poses a question, it's always for our benefit. Before we get into the question of Genesis three, let me show you something. Go to Job chapter 38. Remember, Job, God allowed Satan to test Job and Job. Uh, you know, he didn't curse God and die, uh, as his wife suggested that he does, but go to Job 30, but Job, after listening to his friends and dialoguing with his three friends, he had gotten to a point, Job that is, to where he started questioning God. You know, he, he started believing that he was suffering unrighteously. You know, he didn't deserve, uh, what it was that he was experiencing is how Job, uh, eventually got. And so by the time you get to Job 38, God's going to speak uh, for the first time. And he's going to have a conversation with, with, with Job. Uh, and in and, and Job chapter 38, and you look in, in verse number one, listen here, the first three verses, because God is, is, is fed up with Job and his friends, and the Lord's going to speak. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkened counsels by words without knowledge? Gird up now your loins like a man, for I will demand of you and you answer me. Because if you read the book of Job, Job is throwing questions at God. You know, he's questioning God as if he's God and God has to answer him. And so in verse number three, God tells him, gird up your loins like a man, for I will demand you and you answer me. And brothers and sisters, that's where it's at. At the end of the day, we have to understand we answer the God. God does not have to answer to us. We answer to him, and that's what we have to make sure we get in our spirit. And so God is going to deal with Job and going to ask him a series, and if my count is right, about 72 questions that Job, you know, definitely uh, he can't answer. God's going to give him a series of questions, you know, that he can't cannot answer. He wasn't there when God created the world. He wasn't there when the angels were created. He wasn't there when God formed the world. And so what are you what are you doing questioning God the way you were questioning God? But nonetheless, go back to Genesis 3. 
Let's look at these three questions and then we're done. I want to look at the three questions after Adam and Eve fail that God asked them. And then again, I'm not just looking at this tonight just to look at the questions that God asked Adam and Eve. I think you all know that. We need to look at these questions and also understand these are questions that God asked you and I. And we need to be asking ourselves. And the first one is in verse 9, Genesis 3, 9, where are you? Where are you? Now look at verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, verse 9, where are you? Now, Adam's relationship with God has changed, brothers and sisters, and he's hiding from God. And why is he hiding? Because of his sin. Because of his sin, he's now, him and he are on the run from God because of their sin. And so they're still alive. They're still moving. They're going about their, their, their daily life. But their relationship with God has been hindered. And God's asking the question, where are you? Again, he's not asking geographical location. He knows they're in the Garden of Eden. That's where he put them. But where are you spiritually? You know, a lot of time, brothers, says, I think these are questions we need to ask ourselves as we navigate ourselves through this life. Where are you? See, I don't know how many days left in the year, but I'm sure a lot of us have made New Year's re resolutions. You know, we make these resolutions. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do this if I got a 401k. Uh, I'm going to have a good fantasy league football team, whatever it may be. You decide to, to make, you know, resolution. But here's the most important question you and I need to be asking ourselves as we make resolutions. If, that, if you're one that do that, where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you? Where are you spiritually? Are you closer to God? Or are you further away from God? Are you standing on the promises of God? Or are you, are, are you, are you doing your own thing? See, if you, and when you ask yourself that, I ask myself that, do I find myself stronger than I was yesterday or a month ago or a year ago? So, brothers and sisters, there's got to be some growth. Where are you? Where, where are you? The second question, real quickly, in verse number 11, he's, he asked, God asked the question, who told you? Who told you? He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you should not eat? See, the problem that Adam and Eve have is they listen to the devil, brothers and sisters, instead of God. So God wants, who told you this? Who told you to do what you did? God wants to know that. Because God had already told him what to do, right? Back in Genesis 2, 17. When you look at Genesis 2, 17, God told him exactly what to do. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2, 17, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And so when you look at Genesis 3, 11, God is, look at this verse. God is reminding Adam of what I told you. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten? That's what God's going to bring him to. Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded that thou shall not eat? See, that's what God's bringing to his ready collection. Who were you listening to? Who told you that? Who told you to do what you did? He should have listened to the serpent and Adam shouldn't have listened to his wife, brothers and sisters. And that's the end of the story. Because God is the authority. God is the authority. And so a lot of times, brothers, if we find our lives without stability, you know, you know, maybe we, we find our, our lives, you're always in trouble. You just don't seem like you, you're all, you, you're getting ahead. And like, it could be, who are you listening to? You find your life full of drama. Every time you, you go somewhere, it's drama, 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 problems, problem, problem. You be, I have to ask myself, who am I listening to? Maybe I'm listening to the wrong authority. Maybe I, I'm not listening to God as I ought to be listening to God. And that sometimes, brother, that's how a lot of people, even in their, their, their marriages, at their job, we've got to listen to God. That's what we have to listen to. We have to listen to God. We've got to walk with God. Okay? we got to listen to God's word. People all talk to me. You know, if you, the, if you listen to the world, brother, so we're going to find ourselves in a bunch of trouble. You know, the world say, like, I shack up six months and you're married. Who told you that? See, that's the world's uh, doctrine. You know, we understand you got to be married. You can't run around fornicating and then talk about a marriage. You, you can't do that. And the third question, final question, God asked him, go back to Genesis 3 and look in 13. The Lord God said unto the woman, what is that thou hast done? 
And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. The third question, what have you done? See, what God wanted Adam and Eve, and what he wants you and I to do, brothers and sisters, is just con consider the severity, consider the, the consequences of the choices we make. Well, what have you done? And you know, what, what's amazing when you look at that, they ain't answering. <laughs> Adam and Eve does not answer the question. And that's why a lot of people are going to have trouble on Judgment Day, because they won't admit what they've done and repent. What have you done? That's what God wants to know. People will go to hell because they refuse to repent. Refuse to believe that sometimes the actions you and I perform are sinful. We shouldn't have done it. We shouldn't have said it. Shouldn't have thought it. And you need to repent. Be willing to remit, uh, admit that and repent. And so they did not admit it. I mean, at the end of the day, they don't. What, 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 have, what have you done? And, and look at this. What happens is with sin, there's consequences for sin, brothers and sisters. And the consequences for Adam and Eve here was they got kicked out of the garden. They got an eviction notice. Look at verse 22. The Lord God said, behold, Genesis 3, 22. Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent forth from the garden of Eden sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Okay. And so because of that, you know, there's consequence. Their life was harder. The, the work was harder because, you know, because of their sin. And so we got to ask, what about us? You know, what have you done? What have I done? What have I done in my life that maybe I shouldn't have done and I haven't repented of? What have you done? And we've got to be willing to admit it, brothers and sisters. Too many times, it's not my fault, blame it on somebody else. No, you gotta, I've got to admit my wrong. You got to admit your wrong. See, because when, you, when you're willing to admit and repent, you know, brothers and sisters, it, it, it helps us to re improve our relationship with God. That's all God wants them to do, improve the relationship. You got to own up to what we do, okay? Can't be talking about the devil made me do it. Devil don't make us, can't make us do anything. He, 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 he tempts us, but to do the wrong thing, but he can't make us do anything. Okay. And so I want to just look, I wanted to look at that tonight. God asked questions. Let's remember the questions God asked. And uh, we need to ask ourselves uh, these questions as well. Where are you? Who told you? And what have you done? And I think that'll help us if we're honest. It help all of us with our relationship with God. Okay. All right. Any other any Bible questions? Anybody have any Bible questions? Uh, go ahead, Brother Green. Uh, I have two questions, uh, Brother Stevenson. My first question is uh, going back to Genesis three and seven, uh, where it says, "And eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons." So my first question is when it says and their eye and the eyes of them both were open, what is the scriptures describing there when it talks about the eyes of them both were open? That's my first question. Okay, and, and that would that would imply their eyes are open uh to understand what's good and what's evil. Yes, sir. My second question that I had, which is a question that was asked to me, was uh, did Adam and Eve go to hell because of what they did? Did they go to hell? I was going to say no. And a matter of fact, go to Genesis 3.22. All we can do is, is say what the Bible and go to Genesis. See, this is, remember, brothers, this is God. The Bible don't say where they went to, 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 to hell. I don't know where they went. Uh, but based upon the scripture, unless somebody can show me a script, based on the scripture, we know that what God did is he provided a covering for them. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the only answer I can give, uh, that God provided a covering for them. And if they obeyed God throughout the rest of their life, then they're in good standings. Yeah, but uh, that'll be determined by God. But look what God did for them, though, because remember... What happens is, in verse 22, let's, let's read this, Genesis 3, 22. He says, no, no, go back up to 21. Let's go back to 20. And Adam called his wife named Eve, 
Genesis 3.20, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. So in this, in this case right here, what, what, what God is showing us is that it always took something innocent, someone innocent dying for the guilty, bloodshed. When you look at Genesis 3.21, God is showing us through Adam and Eve. See, if it's coats of skin, that means something had to die. There was an animal of some sort that had to die. I don't, remember, they're covering themselves with fig leaves. That's what they're trying to cover themselves with. They're trying to cover their own shame. But God showed, loves Adam and Eve enough that he kills an animal. God sheds blood and God puts a new coat on, a coat of skin which is showing us God's mercy for them and all mankind. God provide and does something that you and I can't do for ourselves. And that's what he's showing us here. This is an example of what God's going to do for us through Jesus. The lamb of God will be blood will be shed so that you and I can be covered for our sins. Something tough one, something innocent. The animal didn't commit sin. Why would God kill the animal? He's showing us something. He's showing us some animal is innocent. Jesus was innocent. He's the lamb of God, innocent. But you have the innocent that's dying for the guilty, bloodshed. Because without the re remission of sins, without the shedding of blood, is really what the Hebrew writer says, there is no remission of sins. So God is showing us here, he covered their sins. Now, all I know, if they live faithful, they got in. That's all we can say. That's really the only answer anybody can give. We don't know whether he went to heaven, heaven or hell, less you can read it in the scripture. Okay. Thank you, Brother Stevenson, yeah. because that, that was the answer I gave that we can't say because the Bible doesn't tell us uh, where they ended up. So thank you for Amen. that. I just to double check to make sure that the answer that I gave was correct. Yeah, good, 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 good question, my brother. Amen. That's why we got to just speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent. Yeah, that's it. Any other questions you might have? Thank you, Brother Green. Anybody have any other Bible questions? Any other questions or concerns? Any questions? All right. If nobody has questions, that's why we're okay. Oh, go ahead, Brother Adams. In your chapter three and verse okay. number, verse number 25. Daniel 325. Here's my question. And it, it this came up in the Honestly, I, I never thought about it until it came up. I was talking to a brother. Um, he said, and I don't know, in your studies, maybe uh, I'm asking because I, I don't know. Um, but it says here, he said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the NASB, but hopefully that's okay. He said, look, I see four men loose and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. I think the King James Version says it a little differently. It says, is like the son of God. The question is, and this what I was taught, what I've always heard, and I'm not sure it's accurate, is that that is Jesus that was amongst them. But that's not what this verse says. But in your studies, you might be able to clarify. So that's the question. Is that Jesus as the fourth man, or is that, just a man because this is nebuchadnezzar talking right right it's uh yeah nebuchadnezzar uh is actually talking here and he says the fourth is like the is like the son of god yes. you know uh sons of god for instance was a terminology that you let, let me let me let me back up we got to remember that this is prophecy and what god can what god can do does is he can use men to prophesy certain things, and it would be for the benefit of those that are will, will immediately, when it's prophesied, uh, be benefited by, or it can also be beneficial to you and I today. It, it, it's something that's like a dual prophecy. And so remember, Daniel is writing this down, and he's writing this down because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's one of the things we cannot miss. And so when he says, like the son of God, let me say this. When Nebuchadnezzar said it, 
Did he really believe? He couldn't have known it was Jesus. Let's get that out of the way first and foremost. He, he could not have known this was Jesus because nobody knows Jesus. Nobody, nobody, nobody knows Jesus uh, as Jesus. And so, but the son of God, the terminology was like what the angels were called. Like when you look at Job 1, 6, let's look at that. Job 1, 6, and this, remember this, Nebuchadnezzar is a Gentile. That's exactly what he is. He's not a, he's not a Jew. He's from Babylon is, is where he's from. And so when he says sons of God, he's saying it through prophecy because the Lord made him and the Lord created him. But we have to keep in mind, too, that angels in the Bible were referenced to as, as sons of God. In, in Job chapter one, now we know Jesus wasn't an angel. Uh, and so, and maybe somebody else can have more clarity on this, but when he says this, I think he just, he's able to say this because, and Daniel writes it down because God allowed him to write it down Around, write it down this way. In Job chapter one and verse number six, now there was a day, now listen to it, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And so angels were called, were called sons of God. And so was, when, when Nebuchadnezzar said this, is he thinking, you know, he sees a, a, a fourth I mean, I want to read this again. He answered, Lo, I see four men. That's what he said. Four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt in the form of the fourth. The form of the fourth, he says, is like the, the son of God. And could he be meaning angels in the context? I don't know. Does anybody have anything they, they can add to that? Anything? Yeah, they, they, yeah I'm, thinking, I'm thinking also that that's referring to an angel because, like you were saying, nobody knew who Jesus was. And his first coming to the earth, we read uh, when he was birthed by Mary, because I know in the book of Hebrews, it talks about when they were going through the wilderness and it talks about how that rock was was Christ. I believe that that when it's referring to that, it was talking about the spirit of Christ, you know, not Christ in a form, you know, like Nebuchadnezzar sent him in the fire. So I'm thinking that's referring to an angel as well, because like you said, you know, nobody knew who Christ was, you know, and how would Nebuchadnezzar, especially being a Gentile, know who, what Christ looked like? So that's what I'm thinking as well, my brother. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anybody got? Oh, go ahead, Brother Coffee. It's a great question, too, by the way, Brother Adams. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and dig into this myself. Brother Coffee. Uh, yes. When we look at the verse, um, verse number 25, in the, in the latter part, it says, and the form. Uh, it says, in the form of the fourth is is like the Son of God, and what's what's coming to my mind is the image. Um, not, I mean, I, what is? It's not a physical body, but it appears to me now whether it was an angel, I'm not, I can't say, but to me it seems like there's an image that he had recognized, opposed to us saying he saw Jesus, which was which would which would not be true based upon the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, good question, Brother Adams. Anybody have anything else they want to add to that? Brother Adams, do you have a thought on it yourself since you brought it? I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on it, Brother Adams? Yeah, no, I, when I heard it, uh, you know, said, I'm, I'm going to tell you, growing up as a, well, when I became a Christian, it was, I've heard it taught that that was Jesus. I'm going to put it that way. That's mm -hmm. what I, and it wasn't until this brother said um, what he said about it. Uh, saying that 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 was indeed not Jesus. <laughs> now I didn't say what he thought it was. He just said that's that's not Jesus. Yeah, that's not Jesus. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, hmm. And I said, you know, when we jump on this call on Saturday, I'm gonna just pose a, great a question. It's a good yeah. question. I'm gonna, I want to look into it some more myself too, just to see if I can find some other scriptures that'll match. You know, this brother Coffee got you. End up, my brother. Oh, okay, no, you're good. Okay, then. All right. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking, really yeah, I'm thinking, Brother Stevenson, when they see that phrase, son of God, they might automatically jump to Jesus. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? That, you yeah. know, seeing that phrase, son of God, 
And because there's no S on it, like we read in Job ch chapter one, you know, automatically they jump to Jesus because again, and, and like Brother uh, Coffee was saying, it said, and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. So it yeah. didn't say it was the son of God. You know, he, it said like. So mm -hmm. it, it's something that was similar to yeah. That's what I'm thinking. And then, and no, and, and we don't, I don't want us to miss that he says men. You know, I, I don't, I don't want us to miss that either. He says men. And so he sees, he answered and said, Lord, I see four men loose. You know, and, and again, you know, angels were, when, when they were seen, they were often seen in the form of a man. You know, that's another thing we need to remember. They were, now again, this could be, now, brother, I don't want us to miss this. It could be just, God showing us, and that's why I want to go back and look at it. I'm, it could be the Father showing us through Nebuchadnezzar. He could, he could have given Nebuchadnezzar some insight on something. That's all I'm saying. You, you know that hasn't came to fruition yet. Remember, that's what the Book of Daniel. That's what prophecy is. Prophecy can prophesy about things, and that's what it does uh, before it, it 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 happens. And so I, I'd love to look at that, uh, look at it some more. Uh, yeah, mother, mother. Dear. Can we, read, can we read verse 28? Then 28. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any God except their own God. Amen. There you go. Good, good, good scripture. That's why you keep reading. That's the answer. God bless you. Yeah, so because that there you go. That's the answer. An angel. So yeah, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, who sent who has sent his angel. We are saying his, his messenger. That's really what the word means. And so yeah, that's the I'm gonna turn to circle that right now. Great. That's it. That's how you study. That's it. Angel. Thank you for that. Amen. Brother Lewis. I had a question. Sometimes during our uh, Sunday Bible class, uh, sometimes the word uh God's unconditional love or conditional love is there anything from the scripture that we can say that uh god has unconditional love yeah we were just talking about that the other day there is no brothers and sisters, there is no scripture that teaches that god loves un unconditional there, there are just not i want to look at this word i want to look at that i want to i'm just gonna look at unconditional this is what this is what the definition of unconditional is not subject to any conditions. That's what unconditional means. Not subject to any conditions. So let me ask a question. If God's love is unconditional, why does anybody go to hell? Why, why, why would anybody go to hell? Remember, he died. Father sent his son for the whole world. That's what he sent his son for. For God so loved the world, John, that he sent his only begotten son. Now, now, now he adds something to that, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have ever. That sounds like conditions to me. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So if you and I don't have a faith that obeys, then it shows we don't love God and God, God don't love us. Go to Psalms 11 and four. Go to Psalms 11 and 4. Yeah, that, that's, that unconditional love is, is ridiculous. You don't, we don't even love people unconditionally like that, unconditional. And we're not greater than God. Unconditional love. Uncondi you expect conditions. You, you get married uh, from your husband, wife, your children. You know, there's some conditions. And, and there's some actions behind it. Uh, Psalms 11 and verse 5. The Lord tried the righteous, but the wicked and him that loved violence, his soul hated. That don't sound unconditional to me. Y'all see that? Yeah, his soul hated that those that that kind of that those kind of people. Go to Proverbs chapter 6. See that unconditional stuff. Is I think that's another doctrine from the desk of Satan. 
Because if we're not careful with that, it, it, you know, it, it's kind of like the grace thing where people take it in vain. It gives you a license. You know, I can just do what I want and God will just love me anyway. You know, and, and we got to be careful with that. Um, Proverbs 6 and verse 16. These six things of the Lord, hey, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent bloods. If you don't repent of none of this, there's some condition. The condition is you're doing this, you need to repent. A heart that divides wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh a lie, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Okay, a, a proud look, a person that lives a life without looking to God. Pride, that's what a, a proud look is. You have pride, you forget about God. That's a proud look. As if I got what I got, I've accomplished what I've accomplished on my own and without God. That's a proud look. Because what we're supposed to be doing, looking to God, that's what we do. And, and as the source and, and recognize he is the source of everything that you and I have uh, and everything that we are. OK, Brother Coffee. Uh, actually, I got the answer. Thank you. brother. OK, OK. A proud look. OK, Brother Adams. Yeah, I, I recall you saying that uh, I think that was earlier this week. Um, and it prompted the thought, um, you know, try to mimic God as a parent. Um, and that's where, in terms of, you know, how I parent and, and and try to raise my children, you know, comes from. And so I'm thinking, I was thinking about that and I was saying to myself, well, shoot, you know, I love, well, this is use John as an example. I love John. I always love John. In, in spite of what he does and what he has done. And so is there conditions associated with that love? I'm asking myself and I'm saying, yeah, I mean, he could do some things that I don't agree with, but in terms of my love for him, you know, that will always be. Now I may disagree with him. Uh, we may be at odds with one another, but in terms of my love for him, I don't think that'll ever change. So now I go back and I look at John 3.16. Uh, now, is there conditions associated with being saved? Absolutely. But in terms of what God did for the world, that was just love. Love for mankind created in the image of God. I'm just, I'm, I'm just when you said it earlier this week, I was thinking about this Um I don't know that there's conditions on that love, that agape love, that selfless love that he showed in the giving of his son. Now, whether or not we decide to accept it and do something with it, that's something completely different. But I think from God, if I put myself in God's shoes as a father, I don't know if that's, I mean, help me out. I don't, but I don't see that as a conditional love. But you're on mute, Brother Henry. No, I, 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 I want to jump in there on that. Okay, I look at that, and I'm listening to what you're saying, Brother Adams, and that brings to mind 2 Peter 3, 9. You know, and the part that I'm really looking at, you know, it said the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. But it says, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should be called to repentance. Now, in that scripture, you see that, you know, God don't want to see any of us die in our sins. OK, he don't want to see any perish. But at the same time, you know, he has to be fair. He has to be who he is. So regardless to the love that he has shown us, he, there's also consequences if you don't do what the Lord say to do. And I think that even in that, there are still conditions. He's being patient with us that we don't end up perishing. But at the same time, if we don't meet the conditions that he set forth for us, then we are going to perish if we don't you know, do what he said to do. So going back to what you were saying, like concerning your son, yeah, you're going to love your son. You're going to be patient with your son and you're going to hope that, you know, he does what's right. But if not, you know, it, the end is going to be what it's going to be. You know, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, because God, remember, God is love. Remember the scripture, she said, and, and, and I'm, I see what Brother Adams is saying, too. I see, and, and good point, Brother Green. You know, that should be our DNA. We are to, we are to love. We're in the business of, of, of showing people the love of Christ, being loving, being compassionate. Uh, but the, the, the people that we show the love to, they have to, they have to be willing to receive that and meet the conditions in order to, to show they appreciate that love and to receive, and to receive the love. And that, that's what I mean by that. Yeah, you and I don't stop being loving because that's just who we are. This is how we can love our enemies. You see what I'm saying? We love our enemies well, because we have the love of God. While we were enemies, the Bible is clear. God sent his son to die for our sins. But in order to embrace that love fully, see, there are conditions that have to be met. That's the point I'm making. Did that mean that you, the prodigal, the prodigal son, when Jesus tells that story about the prodigal son, the father, even though that boy was dead, remember what the scripture called? He was dead. But the father was hoping that he'd come to his senses and come back home so he'd be alive. The father never stopped loving him. But there were some conditions that had to be met by the boy in order to come back and embrace the father's love. There's always conditions. Even though the father, yeah, I love him, he, he's gone, but but in order for him to experience all my love, he has some conditions to meet. It doesn't stop, it doesn't change who I am. And so, because our kids walk away, or people don't treat you, our enemy, it doesn't change who you are. You're still loving, but what we're talking about is, there are some conditions that has to be met by the people in our life in order to experience all that love. That's just it. Because as long as you're away and not living right or doing right, you can't experience all my love. There are some things that you and I can't do. It's where the withdrawing comes in. There are some, some, some things, some fellowship we cannot not have because you don't love God like you're supposed to love God or like you claim to love God. Okay. Uh, I saw Brother Coffin and Brother Hanyu. Um, Brother Hanyu was first. Uh, go ahead, Brother. Okay, Brother Hanyu. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, get clarity on what's being asked. Is it that there is a condition that was placed upon God or God set conditions in sending Jesus into the world that all men would be saved? Is that what we're, is, is that the question or is the question that in order to receive the benefits of that love, uh, one must do something. What 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 is this? The question is what I'm getting at. Well, I think the question, question at it. Yeah, the question is: God loves unconditionally. Does yeah. God love us unconditionally? That means, and and when people say that, I'm, I'm taking it from the standpoint of it doesn't matter what we do or don't do. We will always be under the graces of God, and I don't think uh, there's no there's some conditions. See, mm -hmm. you and I can't take advantage of God's love. See that there's some conditions for that, and, there, and that's why I read Psalms and then Proverbs because God is very clear that I hate that stuff. Amen. And you need but to I, fix I, that. Then I have a question, uh, and I'm asking. Yeah. So, good. so. What was the condition that God put upon man that he would send his son into the world? Good question. That they would repent. Okay. They, they so, would repent and, and yeah. obey the gospel. No, no, no. I'm saying before he sent his son, you know, God was going to send his son, right? right. He knew that. Right. So was there a condition that God placed upon man? So, all right, I'm going to send. Okay. You all aren't going to make it as you are you need right. help right i need right. to send my son because that's the only thing i'm going to accept so my question is did god place a condition upon that gift of jesus that he sent into the world separate and apart from anything i mean was there was there something that needed to be met was there uh, 
something that man had to do for Jesus to come? Or did God just say, I love this creation that I call man so much. I need to bring him back to me. I need to reconcile the relationship. And the only way I can see that is through my son, whom will be the sacrifice to do what no man can do. And and, and that 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 act that's what I'm saying, asking. Yeah, well, and, and that act, brothers and sisters, is Was what shows thing? us mm -hmm. that the father loves us. I'll make sure we get that. That is the act. Now the is act. that act just that act? I'm only dealing with that yeah. act itself. Right. Does All that, that act, act does is shows us God the, the, the love that the father has for us. That that act only shows us that the father loves mankind. Right. Does that act of love, just that act, does it have conditions placed upon it? Does the act of him just sending his son have conditions yes. on it? Right. Because no, without just, that, no man would be saved, right? Right. So does that act that God did for mankind, all of man, forward and backwards, does that act of sending Jesus that he did did that have conditions upon it? If yes. so, I mean, when you, well, when you're saying did it have no, that's just God showing his love. That, so that, that was I, an unconditional love, act of love, correct? Well, that's but remember, that's who God is. Remember, God, remember the scripture, that's who God is, love. Right. See, when you I'm saying, see, go ahead, go ahead, my brother. No, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was saying so, and I'm asking. So would you call that act, since there are no conditions, there are no provisos attached to that act of sending Jesus, would that act be considered an unconditional act of love? There were no requirements, there were no provisos, if you will, there were no um, parameters around that act that God did for mankind, would you consider that unconditional? No, I think, here's, here's what I'm, and I'm trying to see where you are, but when God sent his son, and I want to make sure we get this, bro says God is omniscient. I'm going to say that again. God is, a, so when God sending his son, he knows that through his son, even before he sent him, that through my son, people are going to be saved. But the people are going to be saved based upon the conditions, their obedience to this sacrifice. So, it, okay. and, and, and so, yes, okay, God loved us. Did he have to love us? No. Did we no, do anything to deserve it? No. no. We, didn't we didn't do anything to deserve the father sending his son. I, I guess, uh -huh. yeah, I guess what I'm saying is another way of looking at it is God gave us a gift. Right. That gift yes, was sir. Jesus. Right. Yes. And man, it's up on it's incumbent. It's incumbent upon man to either receive it or reject it. Right. Right. That's a condition. You can you can that that is a condition. You can take it yes. or leave it. Right. Right. Yes. Sir. But the fact that he gave the gift, his act was an unconditional act of love, would you say? Or was there a condition that God had to motivate him to send Jesus? Did he, was it motivated by a condition or did he just do it uh, being benevolent on his own? Yeah, on just his own. sending Jesus is an act of love. Yeah, man. We, all, we, we all agree upon that. Yes. So if he sent Jesus without being influenced, without being pressured, without any parameters being in place, the question is, would we consider that an unconditional act of love? Now, the other side of that is receiving or uh, being the recipient of the benefits of that gift. You cannot benefit from that gift if you don't receive it the way he say you should receive it. Right. On the one hand, we're talking about receiving a gift that was given out of love, a benevolent gift. On the other side of that, we're looking at how to receive, how to 
uh, benefit from that gift. It seems like those are the two things that we're. Yeah, talking but if you about. don't, but, but here's the thing though, you and I know, and some of these brothers they can have more to say. But here's the thing though, you have to receive the gift, right? You, you but, see what I'm saying? God whether it's or not, does it take away from His love? No, Amen. Because that's who God is. That's what John is proving. It does not take away from who God is. It right. does so, not take away from His love. So those who are lost, just because they're lost, that's on them, right? Yes. Anyone that's lost, that's on them. Amen, brother. God Andy. loved you anyway. He gave yes. his son, and he loved you so much in spite of you, he gave his son, whom he didn't have to give, Right. he loved you anyway. Right. Now, here's your way to make it right. Now, right. either we make it right, or you just walk away. But I still love you. That's what no. I see God. Well, at the end of the day, though, he, he's not going to love you. You can't. No, I'll no. make sure we get that. At the end of the day, you don't you don't throw people in hell you love. I want to make sure we get, get that. This is important. We get, you don't throw people in hell you love. That's no, right. No. That's right. Yeah, go ahead. Right. He didn't. I think people choose to go to hell when we throw the gift away. Yeah, but God, but yeah, but you, I, I guarantee you there are going to be people on the day of judgment that's going to say they don't want to go to hell. Oh, I, yeah. absolutely. And, no and so why are they going to go? Because they didn't meet the conditions that the father gave of the gift. It doesn't mean God is not loving. God is loving. We got to see that God is a loving God. Regard. If I go to hell, he's still loving. If I become an atheist, he's still loving. That's what I'm saying. I'm, that, that's what I'm getting at. I, I, all I'm saying is the act, the initial act that God gave, was that an act wrought with conditions, or did it have any conditions up on it? And if so, what conditions was it that led him to give us Jesus? That's only, that's the only, thought. Yeah, good point. Only reason he did is because he wanted to. He wanted you and I to have a relationship with him. We were Amen. created in his image. That's the only answer to that. So, so again, what could we say? And I'm asking, based on that. That act was unconditional. Could yeah. you say that? It was an act of love. It was, it was an act of love. Yeah. And, a, and God didn't have to do it. Right. Yeah, so it was an act of it, unconditional love. Just that act. I'm I'm just dealing with that. Sure. That's that's all I was saying. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry no, for taking okay. up so much no, you're time. All right. you're God all right. bless you all. Yeah. God bless you, my brother. Uh, brother Coffee. Uh, yes, to for, for me, um, to simplify what's being asked is, is in John 14, 15, and, and the word, and we know what the first word is, it says, if, if you love me, um, keep my commandments. I mean, God's love is not going to change, but if you don't keep his commandments, it's still not going to change. You're just going to get the consequences because... You didn't obey the commandments that he taught his son that we can read. I mean, that's that's the way I, I see it. I mean, God is going to be loved one way or the other. And, and I agree with you 100%. You don't love someone, you know, when they're at the final judgment, they have to be cast in hell. Why? Because they blasphemed him and, and they rejected his son. You know, so you got to go. That John 14, 15 kind of answers it for me because that word, if gives the condition. If you do what I ask you to do, then you're fine. We don't have to be grappling over whether you're going to love me and whether I'm going to hell or not. Just look, do what I say and you'll love me in heaven. That's my comment. Good boy, my brother. Brother uh, Lewis? Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, so I said, it seems like once we put that, start putting those words unconditional or conditional, that's when the confusion comes in. But like we said, we keep it where the scripture says it's God is love. You know, we, it, it makes it simple. You know, we, we'll be okay. When we start trying to put lines here and there, I think that's when. Uh, the yeah. confusion comes in. That was just my comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, great, great, great. Uh, yeah. So, there, yeah, there is. It's, 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 you know, it's unquestionable. You know, whether or not God loves us, there's no question about it. You know, He loves us. You know, because He could have killed us all, and that that's the key. So, and and so that's why we should be drawn to the gospel. The Father would give His Son to die for us. That, that's showing love. That was an act of love. That was an act of love. That won't change. Because it, again, it shows us who God is. This is what, what causes us to love his son and love him. For them both being willing to, to do what was necessary 
uh, that you and I have the opportunity to even be saved. That's that's unquestionable. You know, we know God, God loves us all. Uh, but when he gave his son, I want to make sure we get this. There are some conditions that are that that he intended to have and us to have when he sent his son. And, see, and that's that's the point I'm making. So when he gave him, he gave him God gave him with the intent of bringing men to him through his son. And I think. But, yeah, we're not questioning at all whether or not the father loves us. That that act proves that. You know, we wouldn't be, how, how do we know God loves us if he ain't done nothing? Well, what he did when he sent his son, he, he, he and this is kind of what we talked about on Tuesday, and I'm, we're going to wrap this up, on Tuesday. Our job, brothers and sisters, is to stir up in people's heart the love that we want from them. That's, that's our job. See, what God did when he sent his son, he was stirring up our hearts to receive his son that will cause us to love him. That's why I was going to say, we didn't love God first. You and I did not love God first. He first loved us. We were unlovable. But what did he do? He sent his son as an act of love. We received that love. And now that love should cause us to want to have a stronger relationship with God. We should express our love to God for what he has done in giving his son. That's what we're supposed to do. Same thing we're supposed to do with our enemies. We want our enemies to love us, love God or love the God in us. So we act in ways to show that love in their heart. They, don't, they, they, they may not like you, but we stir up their hearts by living right, doing right, treating them right. And prayerfully, in, in our acts of love and compassion, it'll cause them to love the God that we serve. That's what we do. That's how you love your enemies. That's the only way you're going to love your enemies. If you and I are waiting on our enemies to love us first, we're missing it. If you're always waiting on your boss to do right, your husband to do right, your wife to do right, you're missing it. My job is to show the love. And then once I show them the love, it stirs their heart and make them want to love me and give me the love that I want them to give me. And we all give God. That's how life is supposed to go. And so that's what God is showing us. This is the example. I'm going to show you I love you and say, my son, based on nothing y'all done, but now there's something you got to do with that gift. Yeah, yeah you got to do something with that gift. It's not no unconditional. Yeah, it, it's not unconditional just to take to, to live how you want and then and then think you're going to still go to heaven because and, and reject his son yeah brother adams this, this is a great discussion um i just want to kind of try to go backwards a little bit brother lewis mentioned if we just stick to the scriptures well agape the definition of agape is defined as unconditional sacrificial love so when you hear whether it's people in the church or outside of the church referencing that type of love that's why they throw that word out there unconditional because the that type of love that's what it is and so that's where that comes from and so the further definition that i'm reading right now it says agape is a kind of love that is felt by and they're talking about a person this isn't this definition isn't talking about god but i think we understand, you know, the context. Agape is a kind of love that is felt by a person willing to do anything for another, including sacrificing themselves without expecting anything in return. Now, that's unconditional. That's agape. That's the definition I have in front of me right now. Um, we can certainly probably pull up the Strong's and maybe look at it there. But I just wanted to say that in regards to why brother, brother Lewis said we just stick to the scripture where that's where it's coming from the scripture on this unconditional agape love, sacrificial love. But I want to um, thank you and brother Hanyard because that back and forth was, was wonderful. And uh, I, I just, you know, I'm, I don't know if we are on the same page or not in regards to this conversation. I think we are, but I'm not 100% sure. Let, 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 let's, let's look at this. Let's, let, let, now, the, the word, I want to look at that. Yes, the, we the, are. Yeah, in first are Corinthians, yeah, first Corinthians 13. But here's, here's now, again, remember, brothers, this is the, the New Testament 
was written in Greek. Now, again, this is why it was written in Greek. And that, that, that was for a purpose. That was a very meticulous language. So when we look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, and you're right, the word is agape, but you want to use the, the, the Greek definition of that word as well. Notice, here's the word he used, charity. Listen to this. And when I know we know it. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak, verse 1, though I speak with the tongues of men of angels and have not charity, I become as a sounding brass a tingling symbol. Though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am none. Now that word charity, that's the word there, agape. Now that's G26. It derives from G25, and it is a love that is affection or benevolence. Specifically, a love feast. Okay, a love feast. Let me let me see. Okay, so now that that's that's that charity he's talking about. That an affection and a an affection for a certain a certain thing. Now let me look at. I want to look at something. I'm just got a Greek in court. I'm gonna go to that love that brother uh, Coffee just brought up in John. I just want to see something here in John thirteen. Uh, you said verse fourteen and verse say that. That's the word. If you love me, G twenty five. Keep my commandments. Here we go. Agapo. Okay. Um, 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 if you love me much, to love in a social or moral sense. Uh, love. Uh, agapeo. And so when Jesus says, if, if you love me, then you will keep my, my commandments. If you have an affection for me, then what you will do, you will, you will keep my, my commandments. And so when we, when we talk about unconditional love or agape love remember this is the point i'm making we are to have an affection an affection uh for christ go to colossians 3 go to colossians 3 but in order to receive the gifts that come with that salvation uh remission of sins there are some things brothers and sisters that we do have to do i i, I and i you, we, love, we want all souls to be saved. I love my kids. You love your kids. But we can't love them more than we love God. That's the whole point Jesus is making, except you hate your father, your mother, your brother, even your own life. He said, then you cannot be my disciple. You can't be my disciples. And so in, in, in Colossians 3, 1, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Now, here we go. Set your affection on things above and not on the things of the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with, with him in, in glory. And, and so there are some things Paul's going to talk about in that you and I have got to put to death. We've got to die to if we're going to experience the love of God of being in his presence whenever we leave here. Because if we die in our sins, heaven, heaven can't be our, be our home. Brother Andy? Uh, your mic's muted, Brother Andy. I don't know if you're talking or not, my brother. Uh, your oh, mic. That's okay. I That's okay. Uh, me. Um, I, I just wanted to add clarity. Please, brothers and sisters, make no mistake. I agree with everything that Brother Henry is saying. We are not, please make no mistake, there is no um, contention, if I Amen. may use that word. Yeah, yeah there, uh, there's none yeah. at all. Amen. I agree with everything he said. I was just addressing, um, I think as Brother Adam said, you know, I'm, I'm guessing the way, because most of us probably have heard that expression, unconditional love, without a shadow of a doubt, we all have to obey every condition that God has set forth, especially as it pertains uh, in the way of salvation and, and, and godliness and righteousness and everything, you know, everything God says we must do and, and to receive this, that, and the other. Amen. We all have to do. I was just addressing um, uh, the aspect of God's motivation when he sent his son. That's all I was saying. I was just trying to, um, define the term, if you will, uh, you know, add clarity to it, uh, never to be in um, uh, opposition. That's what I was looking for. No, no, no. We're just, yeah, God bless you, Brother Hand. Yes, and I don't feel that way, and I hope nobody else feels that, that way either. Uh, yes, 
remember that's just who we are too, brother. We 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 love people. Yes, we have God in us. But look at John 14, 23. But but like Jesus says here in John 14, 23, he's only going to abide with us if we love him. That, that's that's the key. We are to love all people. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. And so the question would be, well, what if I don't keep his words? See, if I don't keep his words, then it's not, I, then I don't love God. I don't love the gift that he has given me. And so therefore, I am an enemy of God. Remember, brother, so when we weren't living right and doing right, we were the enemies of God. But God was still loving. We were still eating. He didn't kill us, drop us dead. We were eating. He called the rain on the just and the unjust. It doesn't change who God is. Yeah, God is a loving God. But there are some conditions you and I had to meet in order to experience that love. He not, he, he, yeah, he loved me, but do I love him? And, and if at the end of the day, if I don't love him, he don't love me, and he's going to cast me into hell. I think what we, we may miss, brothers, is God created us all. God created the devil. You know, do we get that? God created the devil. He made him. He, he, created, he knows him. Nothing God doesn't know. And so what we have to understand is that we must receive the gift that God gave us by doing what God told us to do. Otherwise, he doesn't love us, as we read in Psalms 11 and verse number five. And he will cast us in hell. It doesn't change who God is. But there are, and I, everybody's agreeing, there are, there's, there's no unconditional uh, love on our part. Let me just, maybe that'll help on our part. Don't ever think there's no conditions that you and I don't have to meet in order to embrace the fullness of God's love. I think that's where, maybe that's where we need to go, to see the fullness of God's love. And uh, God, God can get to a point to where he hates us, brothers and sisters. Yeah, he hates you. He hates you uh, for how you treat his son. Yeah. OK. Anybody else? Anybody? Any other question? This is a great study. To, to Brother Adam's point. This is what we need, brother. We're iron sharpening iron. That's all we're doing. I helping each other grow and develop and make sure that we're all listening to God. Agape somebody, is a Greek word for love. Yes, you're right. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, charity. When you see it in the Greek. Uh, G25, because love comes in various forms, right? Uh, there's agape, filio, you know, that the filio where we get Philadelphia, that's that brotherly love, you know, and there's a, there's a sexual love, I believe it's eros, it talks about between the husband and the wife when you look it up in the, in the Greek. And so there are different eros. And so there are different Greek uh, words uh, that express different types of love. Yeah, there, there definitely is. You know, there's a love that I can show to my wife that none of y'all can show. You know, a, a certain act and, and vice versa. And so that's a different kind of love that I, I that we're the show to each other. Hey, Brother Stevenson, I just want to read this scripture. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. OK, I just want to read this scripture real quick. It says, uh, what shall I say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we? that are dead to sin live any longer therein. So that just goes to, you know, back to your point about the conditions. You know, we can't continue in sin that grace may abound, which is, I believe, you know, God giving grace is another form of the love he gives us, you know. So I just want to add that, my brother. Yeah, great point. Yeah, God gave his son. He gives us grace, long suffering, mercy. All those are gifts that, that, that definitely come from God. It just shows his character, who he is. That's what love does. Um, yeah. So anyway, grace. To, man, it was a great study. I enjoyed myself tonight. This is wonderful, brothers and sisters. Wonderful. Anybody have any other questions? Any other Bible questions? Comments? Thoughts? No more questions? All right, Saints. Well, it's been a great night. Thank you all for being on here. I like these Q&As. Remember, our next study together, Be God's Will Be, uh, on Monday. 
Uh, we're in John chapter 12. John chapter 12 is coming Monday on Brother Green's Zoom page at 7 uh, p.m. Central Standard Time. But we're going to continue to pray one for another, brothers and sisters. Let's stay strong. Uh, let's stay strong. The world is getting worse and worse. Uh, and the darker the world gets, the brighter our light should shine. We're going to pray for those up in the north. Uh, Brother Claude, down, they got those storms coming through. Brother Green, I think Nashville. So some people are getting hit pretty hard, and we're going to keep you all in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, go ahead, Brother Green. Yeah, uh, my wife had just texted me something while we were uh, just talking. Now, as some of the tornadoes did hit through parks here in Tennessee. I just think I, I, I know, pray for those people. Yeah. Uh, she showed me some pictures of, uh, of some wrecked houses and everything. Yeah. So. Yeah, we were seeing it on the news before getting on here on Channel 13. It was like a breaking news thing about that storm coming. We definitely will keep you all all in prayer. Anybody else? Any other prayer requests? Any other prayer requests? Okay, if not, brothers, let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you for another opportunity, Father, for allowing us opportunity to be in the land of the living, to look at our lives and straighten up whatever things we may have crooked in them, Father, before that eternal day when you send your son Jesus back to judge the quick and the dead. And Father, I believe everyone on here, we're on here because we do believe. We believe you sent your son, Jesus. We believe that he died. We believe that he was buried. We believe on the third day he rose from the grave. And we believe as we're bowed together in prayer that he's seated at your right hand where he rules and reigns and he has all power and authority in his hand because you gave it to him, Father. And I pray that, Father, we all, all will have a heart and a love to respect uh, the gift the grace that you have shown to each and every one of us, dear God, help us to stand firm and flat-footed and not be fearful in an evil and an adulterous generation. We're living in a world, uh, Father, not too much different than Sodom and Gomorrah, if not worse. But Father, I just pray to Father that we will just do all that we're supposed to do. Father God, to work out our soul salvation with fear and trembling. And dear God, just speak to oracles whenever opportunity affords itself for us to do so. Now, Father, as we open up our lives to you, if there be anything in us, Father God, uh, that you see, Father, that needs to be developed or matured, we pray that, Father, you allow circumstance in our lives uh, to happen, that, Father, that we might be purged uh, from anything, Father, that will hinder us from hearing your son Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. We love you so much, God, for what you've done for us, and I pray we never take it for granted. Be with those, Father, as Brother Green has just mentioned. We're dealing with the devastation of, of the, the storm. Uh, Father, we just pray, Father, that uh, you will just uh, look after your saints, uh, dear God. And I pray that when we see catastrophe, that we will use it, all of us, as an opportunity to search our soul salvation and get ourselves ready, understanding and knowing one day we're all going to leave here. We'll all die if you don't send your son Jesus back, and then we'll be changed if you do. And so, Father, help us to be ready and prepared. Forgive us. As you see the godly sorrow, strengthen us where we're weak. Uh, watch over us as we slumber and sleep. And Father, we promise if we're able, we'll gather together with the saints at the designated locations and worship your name, Father, with, with, with glad hearts. And we'll do it in spirit and in truth. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Love you, saints of God. Appreciate y'all all. Y'all have a good night. Bye. Love you. A good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.